Today is the 8th of April, 2009. We are at the Buffalo Erie County Historical Society. Uh, my name is Wayne Clark and my assistant is Kathleen Matthews. Sir, for the record, would you please state your full name and your date and place of birth? Uh, Richard Francis Carrig. Uh, 9 1923 was my date of birth. And it was in Lackawanna, New York. Okay. Did you uh, attend school in Lackawanna? No, I didn't. I went to a Holy Family Parochial School in South Buffalo. And then I went on to Canisius High School. I graduated from there in 1941. All right. Uh, do you remember where you were when you heard about the attack Definitely. in Pearl Harbor? Uh, I came out of the, I was at the Shea Seneca Theater on Seneca Street. Uh, my brother, my older brother and I, and uh, we walked home and, and we, <laughs> when we got in the house, my father and mother were right around the radio. And we started to say something, they were shh, quiet. So finally, they told us, Pearl Harbor was fine. And uh, we didn't know where Pearl Harbor was, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I vividly remember that. Okay. Uh, did you uh, immediately go into service or did you go on no. to college? No, no, I didn't. Well, they were grooming me to go to, I, I graduated in 41 and uh, I just wanted a break from school. Kinesis is very difficult. Uh, it's a prep school. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, I said, just let me work for a year. So I went to work for uh, Curtis Wright Aircraft and Cheek the Wagon, New York. and. Uh, uh, then, it was coming toward the fall, my mother said, uh, uh, we got to look into a college. So, uh, I didn't want to go to Canisius College. Uh, I had Jesuit training for four years, so uh, they said, well, let's, let's go to Niagara. So, uh, uh, we didn't have a car. My, my aunt, my mother's sister, drove us to uh, Niagara, and I uh, was interviewed, and uh, uh, within the, my stay there, I was accepted. It was very lenient in those mm -hmm. days. And, uh, but it wasn't what I really wanted. So, but I had to appease my mother and father. So I got home and I said, let me think about it. And so the end of the story was that uh, I truly loved the outdoors and I wanted to be a forest ranger. And Syracuse University offered one of the best forestry programs in the country, still do today. So the next day I gave my decision. That didn't go over too well. They didn't want me going to Syracuse. And uh, well, I said that that's what I want to do. So anyway, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have got a semester in. Mm -hmm. I would have been drafted. So I was drafted and really FDR sent me greetings in February of 19, 43, and so the, I think the 1st of March, 1943, I went into the service, you know, I was accepted. Mm -hmm. I had to go down to the, uh, was the old library, uh, downtown Buffalo, and took a physical there. And then uh, right then and there, I selected the branch of service that I wanted. So I selected the Air Corps, because I had a good buddy that was in the Air Corps. Mm -hmm. So uh, I got that done, and uh, then I was uh, shipped off to uh, Fort Niagara in New York. And I stayed there, I think, for two weeks. And they did a lot of processing and uh, different tests. And finally, uh, I remember we had a fallout one morning. And it was in uh, uh, late March 1943. And he called out names, and I was one of them, and he said, uh, you, you guys are all going to sunny skies. And the sunny skies were Miami Beach, Florida. Can you believe this? <laughs> so anyway, by troop train, down to Miami Beach, and you know where my barracks was? In the hotel. 40, yeah, 48th and Collins Avenue, the Copley Plaza. My 25th wedding anniversary, I said to my former son-in-law, uh, who lived in Florida at the time, I said, 
He said, Rich, anything you want to do? I said, I, I want to go down and see if my old hotel or motel is there. So we went down Collins Avenue. And, oh, I saw it, my God. Uh, I go back to uh, 1943. Mm -hmm. And th this time, this was like uh, 1966 or 67. Because I got married when, when I came back from overseas. Uh -huh. And uh, 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 we had three kids in four years. And, uh, I remember the doctor telling me, was, Richard, you don't have to have kids every year. I said, I got it, Doc. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so anyway, uh, I stayed at Miami Beach, and uh, I think I was there for, uh, uh, let's see, April, about seven weeks. And then I was shipped off to Gulfport, Mississippi. Unbelievable. It's like going from heaven to hell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, anyway, uh, I, I went to aircraft mechanic school, and I went there for four months. So we would work on aircraft and go to classes. And uh, so the end of, uh, let's see, March, April, May, let's see, June, yeah, the end of August. I had tried for uh, gunnery school, mm -hmm. so I was accepted. And uh, uh, the next assignment I got after I got out of mechanic school was uh, I went to uh, aerial gunnery school. And wait to hear this one. I went to Las Vegas, Nevada. I'll tell you like this. It sounded like a Hollywood story. Mm -hmm. So anyway, at that time... Was Las Vegas a, a shadow of what it oh, is? Oh, just a shadow. Three, three uh, gambling halls. The only one I remember is the Golden Nugget. Uh -huh. And I went back there years and years later. I couldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. But when I was there, it was three. But anyway, uh, uh, I went there for, uh, I think it was seven or eight weeks. And uh, we got really intensive training there. And a lot of, did a lot of skeet shooting in that, which I loved. Because mm -hmm. I, 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 I used to do a lot of up, uh, upland game shooting, uh, partridge pheasants. So I was good at it. I said it was second nature to me. Mm -hmm. So uh, I did very well at that. And then uh, after I got out of that, I went on, uh, on a furlough. I can tell you an interesting story. Uh, uh, my father uh, <clears throat> sent me a, a, an airline ticket now to fly home from Vegas to Buffalo via uh, O'Hare Airfield in uh, Chicago. So anyway, I went up, it was half civilian and half uh, air corps, the airstrip at Las Vegas. So anyway, uh, I went in the, uh, uh, to the office and presented my ticket and not, not many people there, I'm sitting there and all the while I went to gunnery school, we were just, that, that parachute was part of us. Always had it with you, that parachute, mm -hmm. you're flying. It's your only way if something goes wrong and getting out. So, I, I'm sitting there, I, I went up to the clerk, I said, by the way, I said, do uh, you have any chutes on this plane? Yeah, he looked, he said, what are you talking about? I said, parachutes. Oh, good God, he said, you know how many people we'd have flying if, if, if we, <laughs> and then, oh, I thought, well, all the way home, I just listened to those engines, and so I got home safe. He had a, Nice uh, furlough. And then I went to Salt Lake City, Utah, and uh, uh, we, we formed crews there, our combat crews. Mm -hmm. And from there, uh, we went to uh, uh, Rapid City, South Dakota. That's where I did all my training before going to England. And I was at Rapid City for uh, January, February, March, and um, our CO was uh, Colonel Frank Hunter, West Point graduate, and we had uh, several West Point pilots dispersed among our four squadrons. Mm -hmm. And uh, my, but my pilot was from uh, Pequa, Ohio. He was a farm boy, Leroy Darner, great guy. And anyway, we we trained there. But the weather, you think Buffalo's winters are bad? South Dakota was just horrible. So a lot of times we'd have to, when the weather was good, we'd take off and we'd go down to Piote, Texas, and we would stay down there for a week or 10 days, do a lot of the formation flying. 
and gunnery uh, all, all from down there. But back up in the South Dakota, when the weather was good, we used to fly by Mount Rushmore every day. Mm -hmm. Fly, we, we'd come right up to probably within 100 yards of it. And they're just as gorgeous up close as they are far off. Mm -hmm. It was really handiwork that did that. So then uh, when we got done uh, with uh, our training, uh, Colonel Hunter uh, called, everybody was called in to, to our uh, local theater, our movie theater, and everybody, the cooks, the mechanics, everybody was standing room only. And he came out on the stage, you ever see the Patton movie? Mm -hmm. Well, when I saw the Pat movie, I flashed right back to Frank Hunter. <clears throat> His wasn't blood and guts like, like George Scott made it, but it was, oh, he got us so fired up with it. It was his lifelong ambition to be going overseas with his own group. And, uh, you know, we're going to raise hell with the Germans and da 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 da. And I made that place, I can hear him screaming. Everybody was just fired up <laughs> when we left there. So, anyway, we went out uh, within two or three days, no later than this, and he had us all lined up at the airfield. Our brand new B 17s were coming, the B 17Gs. They had the chin turret. And uh, we were all lining. They heard her circling around. They come in. Half of them were women ferry pilots. We're bringing them in. So, and when that pilot, oh, it was like a kid getting his own Corvette or something. Pilot, oh, my plane. <laughs> oh, look, so we were all excited, you know. So it was wonderful. So, anyway, uh, we, uh, a couple of days later, we left and went to Ardmore, Oklahoma. And we got all. Pre-flighted uh, pre for uh, all our combat equipment and uh, machine guns and all, everything was all set. And then uh, we left there and flew to uh, uh, Goose Bay, Labrador. And uh, <laughs> we had to stay there two extra days. The weather was so bad, as the saying goes, the birds were even walking. It was just socked in. Mm -hmm. So after we had time with weather was right, we took off and flew to uh, Belfast, Ireland, right across the Atlantic. And uh, we had extra uh, fuel tanks into the bomb bays so we could make that uh, long distance flight, which we did. Mm -hmm. And then we, we came into Nuthamstead, England, uh, which was a P-38 base. And they gave up their base so our B-17s could have that as our air base. So for about the first month that we were there, uh, they used to come back and buzz us. I mean those 38s, and it being the knees and hut, and that thing would just vibrate. And then they would take it straight up. I mean, these guys were real jacks, let me tell you, boy. Do a roll and then, and but they did that for about a month, and then they finally, they gave up. So then uh, my first mission uh, was uh, kind of a disaster. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar, you, you rendezvous mm -hmm. when you take off and you, you're rendezvousing for a couple hours. It's, it, and it's very dangerous for fear of mid-air collisions. There's a lot of planes in the air. Anyway, uh, uh, somehow we, uh, I don't know, the pilot, the navigator, they got... Now let me stop you for a second. Did you keep the plane that you brought over? Uh, well, I had it for so many missions. And okay. Then, then we got shot up, so that we had to get another one. But, okay. So, but anyway, uh, uh, all of a sudden we're alone, and I, I'm wondering where the rest of the planes. Well, anyway, the pilot is upset and he's mad, and he figures he can catch up with, with the uh, uh, group that he was with, and he's heading for the uh, channel. And who do you think comes up alongside of us? B-51. Hey, big guy, I can hear him. Yet. Where do you think you're going? The pilot says, I'm trying to catch up with my, the rest of the uh, flight. He says, I'm going to tell you something. Nobody goes over that channel. This was before D-Day. Nobody crosses that channel alone. Turn your big ass around and go on home. Oh, well, man, the pilot went home. Well, what do you know? The whole group screwed up. So, anyway, co-pilot Dick Adler told me the next day, he says to me, Dick, you ought to be glad 
your enlisted personnel and that and officer. He said, the old man ate us up. He called us every name in the book. <laughs> so, so I said, I'm glad I wasn't an officer. <laughs> so anyway, then our first, our first real mission was Berlin. And, uh, uh, you know, I know that questioner, uh, you know, we were, we were young, 20, I rolled this guy and the, uh, the crew was 27. But, uh, you know, we were, we were gung-ho, but uh, a lot of anxiety and apprehension and, uh, you know, you, you just don't know. You'd ask guys that have been there before, and, well, you'll find out when you get over there. You, know, you got answers like that. But anyway, uh, Berlin was, uh, you were in flak for a longer period of time over Berlin. Uh, some of the other targets were very concentrated in a small area, but Berlin, I would say you were in flak for, oh, I would say 12, 14 minutes, and that was living hell. You know, mm -hmm. you just they figure, any second they're going to get it. So then when you got out of there, then you had to worry about fighters. Even at that time, uh, in February of 1944, the P-51 came over. That was the long-range fighter at the time. And... Uh, they were a godsend. Uh, so anyway, uh, we got through the first mission, and then uh, I don't know. I think the questionnaire asked me, "What did you do when the uh, on your idle time?" Well, I, I did a lot of flying. I, I did sometimes four missions in a week, and not easy missions either. Mm -hmm. I went to Hamburg. To me, uh, the toughest target in Europe. I don't care what anybody says. The concentration of flat there, I don't know to this day how we ever got through it. But uh, it, it was just intense. They were protecting those refineries. So I went there, uh, I think June 19th. You know, where do you think I went June 20th? Berlin again. So I said, now I know why I had to fill out that last will and testament when I went into service. Now, all those extra missions you flew on, they, they counted towards Oh yeah, now I'll get into home. that. Now, when I went over, we were to fly 25 missions. We got mission, uh, 25 in, and we, we could go back to the States. So anyway, I had seven missions in, and one day I was in the, uh, in the sack, and I can remember, I was listening to Bunny Berrigan. He was a great trumpet player, but it was a scratchy radio. Uh, can't get started with you, Bunny Berrigan. And I, I'm glad that all of a sudden these guys come in and oh, they're all, they're cursing and upset. I said, what's going on? Did you, did you read that bulletin board? I said, no. I said, I, I've been in here this, get your so-and-so out there and see what's on that bulletin board. Oh, so I got up and walked out and there was a big mob around this bulletin board. <laughs> I finally made my way in. My dear friend Jimmy Lula, uh, Doolittle was our new uh, Supreme Commander. And he said, attention all <laughs> flyers, from this day on, uh, if you have flown X number of missions, uh, I have flown seven, you will fly 18 addition, uh, let's see, I had seven in, yeah, I was supposed to fly 25, so I thought I had 18 to go. He said, you'll fly 25 additional more missions to the seven I had flown. I said, I gotta start all over. 32 missions. So here's, I mean, the 17 missions I thought I had, that was out the window. And that's why everybody was grumbling. So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, you know, you're, you're kind of young and uh, you try to shake it off, so you do. And uh, so then uh, I'm back to the barracks and uh, uh, you know, things that we did, uh, we had certain uh, classes we had to attend uh, because it wasn't like the infantry. You gotta love the infantry. I mean, they got up in the lines. They, they were there for days mm -hmm. and they slept right out there. They had no quarter. I mean, we had a, a nice hut to go to. Of course, the next mission you went on, you don't know whether you're coming back, see. So it was kind of a psychological game. So we, we did different things and uh, we had a pub, uh, we call it a pub. Uh, all you could drink was uh, beer. The, the officers had hired stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, so now let's see, uh, I got, uh, oh, I was uh, trying to remember the mission. 
it's coming back. I got it written down here somewhere. But anyway, uh, we were under fighter attack, uh, ME 109s, and I shot down an ME 109. And uh, I was a top turret gunner, engineer gunner. And um, the, even in, in those days, that was kind of a computerized uh, a gun. Uh, you could, uh, they had a horizontal line and two vertical lines. And if a fighter was coming in head on, you got the horizontal line across his leading edge and the two verticals on his wingtip. And, and you could control that with knots. And as he got closer, of course, you had expanded. And then, then you'd fire. And it would kind of computerize the guns. And, uh, I mean, he's firing, and I would say he was, from me, a hundred yards, something like that, maybe even a little further. All of a sudden, he just, big black ball of smoke, and all of a sudden, he just kind of rolled over, and I heard the pilot saying, you got him, you got him. But anyway, if you shot a fighter down, then you had to have witnesses. Mm -hmm. And most of the witnesses had to be officers. <laughs> Every gunner would claim he got a fighter, see? There wouldn't have been a Luftwaffe left. So anyway, three months later, I had forgotten about it. I was home when I got notification that uh, it was verification that I got that one on the hang. How do you like that? And I, I had forgotten about it. But it's on my, uh, I got it on my uh, mm -hmm. uh, discharge. I got a cluster of the DFC. That's the reason I got the cluster. So anyway, I flew um, uh, the 32 missions and uh, oh, Merseburg. Uh, I went there two days in a row. And, well, I mean, I, you know, there were some brutal missions. I, and I, I, the only thing that happened to me, I had a lot of duties I had to do as an engineer. I had to be able to crank down the wheels if they, if they failed to come down mm -hmm. and land. Uh, I had to close the bomb bay doors. If they didn't close after the bombs were gone, everything on the B-17, except for three items, were all electrical. Entirely different than the B-24, which was all hydraulic. So anyway, three times the bomb bay doors would not close after the... I used to kneel right at the bulkhead when we were over the target and watching that black flag coming up. And, and then when those bombs would go, the plane would kind of lurch up and I'd kind of watch them. And then the, the bombardier would start closing the doors and they wouldn't close. I had to get the crank out and start cranking. So when, we, when I did that, I had a quick get a walk around oxygen bottle. Had to have that. Mm -hmm. So I'd plug into that, and I'd have one eye on that gauge, because when you're working at altitude, you use that oxygen. Oh, it's like doing manual labor. So I'm cranking away, and the pilots, get those GD doors shut. What do you think I'm doing? And because it's an awful drag. He, yeah. He's starting to fall a little back from formation. And finally, oh, geez, I'd get them closed, and quick, Take the battle over and get into the main line of axes. And we had heated suits, by the way, too, mm -hmm. which were great. So any one, one day, I, I, was, I had something I had to do, and uh, I went through the bomb bay, and uh, I forget some, something I had to do with the, uh, with the electrical in the radio room. There was a compartment there. And he asked me to do something. So I, I did it, and I came back. And I got in the turret, and I'm in the turret, and I feel this cold air hitting out of the back of my head, looking around. Oh, oh. There's a hole in the top of the turret that big. And I start looking around, and we had an aluminum plate uh, on the bottom, of, like at the bottom of the turret, and you had stirrups, depending on your height. You could adjust the stirrups. Mm -hmm. There's a hole in this aluminum plate, and I got down out of the turret, and I had a trench knife. And I knelt down, and we had like plywood. And the under part of the fuselage, there was that piece of flat, and I dug it out. It was a piece about that big. If I was in that turret, I would have got it right here. Hmm. That, that was a miracle. It's just a miracle. So uh, I had that flat for years. I had it, I don't know. You know, it's a long time ago. Yeah. I don't know. I, I used to sometimes, I, in the winter, throw it in my jacket, carrying good luck charm, you know. I look at that and think of a very jagged piece. So anyway, a humorous, a humorous story I can tell you. Uh, 
you know, I was, I, I was kind of like a stooge for the pie of it. Anything he wanted, I, I was there, I did it, it was my duty. And uh, on takeoff, I'd stand between the pilot and co-pilot, and we'd have, you know, probably uh, eight, five hundred pound bombs on there, full gas load, we're going down the runway. And all I used to, I'd watch that airspeed, and they'd, come on, baby, get up, get up. Finally, mm, she'd lift off. So anyway, uh, right after the first mission, uh, he turned around, he, he knew I was there. He grabbed me by the leg and says, I gotta go. I said, use a relief tube, Lieutenant. Don't like it, it backs up, find me something. So he said, I can hear him. I said, yes, sir. And I thought, what am I gonna find? I'm like, well, I, and so we're climbing now. See, it's, it's a big strain. Takeoff, very critical mm -hmm. time. One of those engines sputters, you're done. So he'd have the co-pilot taking it up the rest of the way. So I went back to the radio room, and lo and behold, there's an old empty can thing in there. Whoa, look at this. So I tapped him on the gave it So he was done. I said, what the devil am I going to do? Oh, I said, I know what I'll do. So I crawled through my turret into the bomb bay, I wedged it right in with the 500 pounders. So every time we got over the target, I had to kneel at the bulkhead to make sure the bombs were clear of the bomb bay. I could see that can tumbling. <laughs> Here's some crowd saying, God in him of us is <laughs> So anyway, he didn't know what I was doing with that can. So after 17 missions, we were going out, taxiing out, and we I got called back. It was heavy overcast, and so we taxied back in on the tarmac, and we're all laying around. We smoked, and I smoked. We're all talking. I'm finding a pilot. I said, Techie, said, where the hell do you get that can? I said, it's in the radio room. He said, what are you doing with it? Well, I said, <laughs> I said, I stick it with the bombs. He says, you what? I said, yes, that's what, what do you think I'm going to do with it? Well, then he, that's got to be a good omen, he says. <laughs> so anyway, uh, uh, that was 17, we additional 15, but where I found, where, where that can came from puzzled me. So I was talking to the, uh, the uh, a ground crew one day, and uh, I said, by the way, I told him about this can that's in the radio room all the time, a black can. Oh, they said, that's from ordnance. He said, that when they're loading the bombs on, he said, those are bomb nose components in that can. They screw them into the nose, and then when the can's empty, they flip it up into the radio room. Well, I said, you tell them to make sure that can goes in that radio room. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's true story. So that, that was the humorous part of my flying. So then, uh, after that, uh, where did I go? Oh, my last mission was uh, August the 3rd to Pinamundi, uh, Germany. Uh, they were working on the atomic bomb mm -hmm. in off the North Sea. And uh, we had a tragic thing happen. Uh, we used to fly uh, thir 36 bombers from our base. We had 48 four squadrons, 12 to a squadron. But you would always fly three squadrons and one would rest. And anyway, uh, this, uh, this Jewish boy, Dave Buxbaum, a hell of a nice guy. He was a little older. I, I, I would say he was in his 20s. And he was having trouble with the crew that he had been flying with. They were, they were persecuting this guy. So anyway, he asked Captain Ireland if he could be transferred. And he got, he was a radio operator, and he got transferred to a Lieutenant MacArthur. Never forgot his name. His first mission, it was Buxbaum's probably 15th mission. And they were flying, we were flying low, then it was medium, then high. And they were in the medium flight, Buxbaum, uh, MacArthur's crew. His first uh, trip with this crew, and the first one for MacArthur, and this upper, Bomber, the group, one bomber had a bomb stuck in the bomb me, and he's doing this to get rid of it. Comes right down into MacArthur's plane and just bingo. Oh, yeah. And Dick Adler, uh, 
who was a Jewish boy, a great guy. I, Dick and I were real close. He lived in Chicago. And he and I saw it, as, we, we saw it because it was on his side. And the pilot's busy flying. And, and I, I remember Dick saying, we, uh, he said to me, Dick, he said, don't, don't tell Leroy. Oh, I said, I won't tell him, you know. But it was awful. Just an orange ball. And, and I was thinking of Fox Baum was from Rochester, New York. Because I used to chat with him once in a while. And he used to, he used to call me kid. And he'd say, yeah, kid, don't let those bums see me talking to you. Meaning that crew that he was with. Oh, they harassed him. They were awful. So anyway, that, that was uh, uh, in our uh, band group the saddest thing that I saw. It was mm -hmm. you know, because I knew I didn't yeah. know the rest of the crew, but I knew Bucks Bond. And I thought, what a way! Here he wanted to get away from, it. and they were just a bunch of bums. That that crew, they were awful. And here he goes, and, his, and he gets wiped out. It was, just, it was just, you know, very sad. So then I, when I got done, I stayed over in England for uh, about three weeks, and uh, after your last, mission. Yeah, after my last mission, uh, they assigned me to the ski range, which I loved. Incoming new gunners coming in, I, I conducted the uh, ski range, and I did that for that period, two and a half to three weeks, and then I, I, I was shipped home. Now, did the rest of the crew finish up at the same time? Yeah, I'll accept the navigator. He, he missed one mission and had to do it with another crew. Joe Roberge was his name. And he was the youngest guy. He was 19, sharp kid. And he was our navigator. But he somehow missed the mission with us. And we, when we had our 32nd, he had his 31st. So he had to go one more. But he made it all right. And... Uh, then uh, after I got uh, back home, let's see, I came home, uh, what do you hear this, on a C-54, that was a four-engine uh, plane, big, big transport. And we flew from uh, uh, somewhere in Scotland into Iceland. <laughs> and then from Iceland, I flew into uh, uh, the Air Force Base. It's now a Reagan Airfield in Washington, but. I, I forget what the name was then. I landed there and then I went home. And I was home for a month and then three weeks. Uh, I get, that's when I got married. Mm -hmm. I got married in September 23rd, 1944. And then uh, I went to Atlantic City. And uh, I stayed in Atlantic City for two weeks. And I was going through a physical, uh, a major said to me, uh, I uh, see you got married, uh, Sergeant. I said, yes, sir. He said, you didn't have much of a honeymoon. I said, no, sir. He said, how would you like to go to Asheville, North Carolina? Well, I said, I'd love that. He says, all right, we're going to send you there for two weeks. He said, you're, you're free and clear. You'll have to pay half of, uh, for your wife's fare, whatever that was. I said, that's no problem. So then we stayed down there, but it was beautiful. Smoky Mountains and gorgeous area there. So we stayed there for like two weeks. Then I come home and went to uh, Amarillo, Texas, the Panhandle. <laughs> what a godforsaken place. And uh, they really didn't know what to do with us. So you know what I ended up doing? I got a job with the Pantex Ordinance. And I used to take the bus from the, the come in, it would come into the base from Pantex and I would the bus would take me into their factory uh, in Amarillo, and I would work the 4 to 12 shift. How do you like that? Got my civilian pay plus my military Oh, my God. <laughs> of course, it wasn't much pay, but at that time, it was pretty good. Yeah. And uh, so I stayed there, and then uh, after there, I shipped to uh, uh, Chinook Field, Illinois. And... Uh, I stayed there from, uh, oh, let's see, around January until I did all kinds of work on aircraft. I didn't fly, I wasn't flying anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, I was doing all kinds of just mechanical work in AT6s, oh, on cargo planes, everything. So I worked there until uh, I got my uh, discharge notice in October. I went to Rome Airfield, uh, 1945. Uh, and uh, I think on my discharge, it's the 31st of October. And uh, 
That was my career in the military. When you got out, did you make use of the GI Bill? Oh, I was a fool. What happened was I, well, when my first daughter was born, ten months after I was married, and uh, uh, you know, I, I wanted to go back to Syracuse. That's what I wanted to do. But I'm, I was living at the time then in Lackawanna, which is a suburb of West Seneca where I live now. And next thing I knew, my wife was pregnant again. I said, oh, God, I, I, I don't think I can go to Syracuse. How am I going to do this? So I ended up, I was doing different jobs, and finally I connected with the, uh, I got with the Ford assembly plant, and I saw old Henry. You ever see pictures of him with that straw derby? Uh -huh. I saw him in the flesh in April of uh, 1946. And uh, I was working at the assembly. When I got out, that's sort of the first place I went, that assembly plant. I got ahead of myself. And uh, I was working on the trim line. And uh, we were all leaving one day, and we seen this big, at that time, it was like a limo. It was old Henry. But I didn't see him in the limo, so we all stopped. And when he got about maybe 100 yards away, he disembarked. And they're saying, there he is, that's the old man, that's old Henry. So I got to look at him. And uh, anyway, that, that, that was kind of a highlight. So I worked there until, um, I think, uh, I was there nine months. But they had coal strikes and steel strikes. I'd be working uh, three days a week, that's all. I, I couldn't, couldn't make a go. I was only making $35 a week, working five. So uh, finally I got out of that. I got into different things. Finally they opened a stamping plant in Hamburg, New York. Ford did. Mm -hmm. And I went right down there and got hired. And I stayed there and I ended up chief engineer there until uh, I retired in 1982. So I've been retired since 82. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of jobs since I've been retired. But uh, it's kind of been, uh, I had I got three beautiful daughters. So that's my life. <laughs> mm -hmm. Did you uh, stay in contact with any of the guys who were in the uh, service? Yeah, the, um, the pilot. He went on to become a, uh, he went home and figured he was going to be an airline pilot. He and 50,000 other pilots thought the same thing. Mm -hmm. He found that out. Forget that. So then he, he re-enlisted. In fact, I remember I got a letter. They wanted me to come back in. They would give me the time that I was away, they would give me that back pay, keep me at my tech sergeant rank. So I was meditating that, but I couldn't do it. I mean, I had the, the baby, the baby on the way, I thought. Yeah. So anyway, uh, let's see now. I got a lot of these things going on in my mind here. Uh, oh yeah, well, I, I, didn't, I didn't accept what the Army went, or the Air Corps went. So I gave, but anyway, Leroy, my pilot, uh, he went on uh, to become a B-52 command pilot, big time. Mm -hmm. And then, when he retired from that, he became the uh, FAA, joined them. So he retired, and I think in 1984, he was a double dipper for the pension. He lived two years. Oh. But Leroy was a big, big smoker. Oh, my God, I could see the nicotine on his fingers yet. And, uh, well, it was sad, just sad. But I talked to him and my grandson, who was all hopped up about the Air Corps. Uh, I, I, got to, I said, I'm going to call the pilot up. So I let my grandson talk to Leroy. Mm -hmm. Well, that was the biggest thing. <laughs> he loved that. Did you uh, join any veterans organizations? Yes, I, uh, well, I belong to the Historical Society, I think that Bob, mm -hmm. I told you, Bob Bolt. Uh, I did join the Legion, but uh, I, I didn't stay too long with the Legion. I, I don't know the, uh, I didn't, I mean, a lot of the people I met, uh, they, they weren't combat people. I, I was more mm -hmm. interested in meeting fellows who were in combat. A lot of them were stateside. Yeah. So I left that, and uh, then uh, I waited in the 
joined the historical society here back in the 90s. Okay. That's, uh, Did you attend any reunions at all? Yeah, I went to a reunion and uh, I lived in Florida from uh, 1981 uh, until 1986, five years. And I had to come home because my wife had a stroke. So when she was, when she was able to uh, talk, she told me, Richard, you're never burying me here, take me home. So, I mean, selling a home in Florida, they were a dime a dozen. But anyway, I got out of there. But I went to a reunion in uh, Hollywood, Hollywood, Florida, on mm -hmm. the East Coast. And uh, that, that was in around, before my wife had a stroke, it was around 1987 that I went there. And, uh, but it was tough. Uh, a lot of the people, were replacement crews. I was looking for, see, I went over, we went over as a brand new unit. Mm -hmm. Now, as, as we lost people, replacements would come in. And I met several replacement crews, but they didn't know that some of the regulars that I knew, so it was mm -hmm. kind of tough. So, oh. How do you think your time in the service changed or affected your life? Well, I don't think it affected me too much. I mean, uh, uh, well, I mean, I, I wasn't subjected to uh, to a prisoner of war camp. There were a lot of atrocities that occurred, occurred you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was just very fortunate, and uh, I think, uh, you know, some people may go psych psychologically, they were damaged. Uh, but no, I was able to, uh, I don't know, I just shrug it off or something, I guess. I didn't meditate on it too long. You couldn't. Mm -hmm. I didn't dare. And uh, I, I never heard too many guys, a few guys would start yelling and hollering and we'd tell them to shut up. You know, I mean, you're trying to keep it going yourself, you want to hear yeah. somebody else. So, but I mean, it's all Wayne, that was about it. Okay. Do you want to hold up that uh, photograph right. you have and yeah. point out the different people? Oh, okay. You want me to stand up now? Uh, you can, right. can hold it back there, I can, I can zoom right in on If you can... Uh, Get this out of the way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if you can hold it just Yeah. All right. Yeah, that's good. Perfect. Right. Uh, this is Ray Smith, tail gunner. He was from Kansas. Uh, this is Joe Roberge. He was the navigator. Well, that... I'm getting some glare off the oh. uh, off the light. If you can just tilt it this way a little more. Okay, that's good. Where's the navigator? This is the navigator. Joe Roberge, uh, he was from Massachusetts at the time, now he's moved to New York. Okay. Uh, this is Leroy Darner, my pilot. Okay. This is Hal Reeves, a bombardier from California. Okay. This is Richard Carrig. Uh, okay, your, your finger's in the way, I can't see their face. All right, who's, oh, that's you. That's me, yeah. Okay. Uh, this is Dick Adler, co-pilot. Okay. Uh, this is Ambrose Gerstner, waist gunner. See him? Yep. And this is Clyde Burton, uh, Blue Island, Illinois, ball turret gunner, the worst job in the bomber. Okay. I think I got them all. All right. And uh, how many are left? That's hard to say because uh, the last one I talked to was uh, Joe Robers, the navigator. Okay. Right here, I, and uh, he um, uh, he told me he couldn't not get in contact with Ray Smith or Clyde Burton, so he couldn't uh, uh, he couldn't give me any data on them. I mean, they would be all my age, like eighty-five. Okay. And um, uh, I I hope Joe is still alive. I'm trying to find him now, the uh, navigator. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your interview. Oh, okay. <laughs> you mean... uh, thank you again. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kathleen. Thank you so much for coming yeah. in. Oh. It was very good. Yeah, very good. Yeah.